Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Corey, the co-founder and CEO of Precursive. Welcome back to another edition of the Precursive Perspective slash Precursive Podcast, whichever one you choose to use. Uh, welcome along to those of you tuning in. Welcome back to uh, people that are following the show. I, I, I checked in and we're now um, pushing several thousand uh, listens, which is great for, a, for quite a small show but an eclectic mix of luminaries across the world of customer success and, and professional services globally. Uh, and if you're tuning in for the first time, um, what took you so long? So uh, on this show, we explore a range of topics uh, in the customer success ecosystem uh, centered around the world of SaaS and B2B professional services. Um, we've tried to impact some of the emerging issues for people and companies in the new remote reality, as well as some of the changing customer behaviors and market dynamics that are changing the way that organizations think about customer success in general. Uh, and in this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Miranda uh, Dikonski, who is the Chief Customer Officer at Swiftly, um, who has a wealth of experience in the world of startups in Silicon Valley, as well as larger enterprise organizations, both as an operator and as an advisor. So welcome to the show, Miranda. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me here. Very excited. Yeah, del delighted to have you on. Um, given that, as you obviously, I, I chat to the guests before they they join, and uh, you're joining us on your on your on your anniversary day, and, and you're saying that I'm the first person that you've spoken to today in advance of your husband, which is which is <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are the first person. It's really early. Um, I know we're on the opposite uh, sides of of the time zones yeah. here. Yeah. Um, me being out in California. Um, and yeah, so my husband works very early morning hours. He works for actually BP oil. Um, mm -hmm. so he works usually five, five thirty in the morning. Um, so he was already working and yep. haven't had a chance to even speak to him. So you're the first person I'm talking to today. <laughs> so. uh, one of, one of my old customers, BP, uh, was, I used to work with their their CIO, Mike Gibbs, who's re retired now, um, doing some leadership development work for that for that organization. So uh, a great company and obviously a British company like, like myself, yes. hence the accent. Um, so so thank you for taking the time to join. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind just starting with, just give us a bit of background to yourself, your, your current role and a bit about some of your career highlights up to this point, if you don't mind. Yeah, so uh, this year... I actually hit uh, 24 years doing customer facing work. Um, I don't know if I should admit that out loud because it, it dates me a bit, but that's okay. Um, so I have had my bumps and bruises along the way. I started out uh, in call centers uh, doing customer service and kind of worked my way up over the years. Um, I have worked at organizations very large with you know, tens of thousands of employees down to very small, with 10 of us sitting around a table trying to figure out how we're going to get customers and how we're going to pay our bills, um, which you know, I found over the years, I prefer the latter. I love the building of startups. I love you know, building teams, helping folks develop their careers. I'm very passionate about customer success. So I land when I landed in Silicon Valley area, it was just like kismet. It was meant to be. Um, and here I am uh, going on 11 years in this area. I've had uh, four equity events. Uh, so I'm uh, alumni of Lending Club, uh, which had a uni unicorn IPO, um, an alumni of HelloSign, which was uh, you know acquired by Dropbox. I joined Castlight, and then we had our IPO, and um, we had uh, JMI do a, a pretty decent investment in Swiftly this last year. Um, yep. So have been through uh, quite a few different types of equity events, and I've also had some failed. Uh, startups as well. Um, one where the Series A didn't convert and mm -hmm. um, we we didn't make it, which is also part of the statistics out here. But I think it's important um, to see both sides of the equation because it makes you very well-rounded. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot there that touches on things that are close to my my heart. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the flip side, the blood, sweat and tears of the, the startup world is, is perhaps... Um, not talked about as much as the the fairy tales and the unicorns and things like this and that, that there's a very uh, there's a big dose of reality out there when when things don't quite go as you hope um it's interesting jmi they're actually uh it, they just in, invested uh, heavily in one of our customers condeco phil davitt was one of our guests on the show uh prior to you so yep small world um i think you know 
the the world of customer success and or the world of being customer facing in your career i'm sure you've seen a lot of different um developments and evolutions over that period of time i think um over the last 18 months two years of course things have changed very radically um uh, w- what are some of your observations really about how the world of customer success has evolved over the last uh, 18 months yeah i i think it's been one of our most rapid evolutionary times um if i if i'm thinking about the last you know 5 to 10 years and i've probably said this two or three years ago too prior to covid that wow we keep evolving and growing and i but i do think our hand was forced a little bit during the pandemic um what i saw happen and unfold is you know companies were having a really hard time acquiring new customers um because there was a lot of economic uncertainty and um the the visual the visual component of oh we have this current revenue that we need to guard became bigger and more prominent especially at the board level and because of that customer success became more front and center um so it it was less around what's going on with sales and more with what's going on with our current revenue how are we guarding it how are we growing it um what are we doing to nurture those relationships what's at risk because you know the the top of the funnel had kind of slowed down um and it it's been a really great opportunity for customer success to shine i think what i've seen is you know the customer success leaders and you know companies who were doing customer success right all along they didn't struggle they just hit the ground running they're like this is just another day we're going to you know double down and do more of what we've been doing and we're going to keep the wheels on and keep things rolling um but those that weren't doing the key activities that they should have been or you know maybe we're still trying to figure it out which is okay uh struggled a little bit and some got their you know some got their momentum and and managed to get on the right course to be front and center while i think others struggled um so those that were those that are strong and doing it well just really had that opportunity to shine uh shine at the organization level shine at the board level uh it's really been a fascinating time yeah absolutely i think the you you hit on you hit upon a a, a few key points there like the microscope was on that existing revenue more than ever before right i think companies yeah. have spent a huge amount of time and effort you know if you if you think about when the pandemic hit even it basically hit what in q1 right yeah. so you had all these yeah. companies that have, would have geared up essentially for that year um who then you know are having to on the fly make a lot of changes and for many organizations i think the the customer acquisition world was the dominant world and i think there's been a leveling up now right across Absolutely. in terms of thinking about it and how it needs to be approached and and the strategies and the investments that are made in it so no i think i think that's very telling um one of the um there's a there's a, a i think every few years there's a thing that ibm comes out with which is that 90% of the world's data right has been produced in the last 2 years and i think like it basically keeps getting updated because it's every 2 years and and there's a lot of talk in the world of saas about the importance of data you are a uh, a data analytics platform uh for for the transit market um now when it comes to the world of customer success data is also very important in, in your experience what are some of the key data points or the metrics that matter uh for 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 customer success organizations yeah so beyond just some of the the standard things that you are just or table stakes like watching usage data and understanding you know what your customers are doing in your product what's working well what's not working well um the there are a few key metrics that i watch very closely um first is nrr so that's my net retention rate um it just tells me the overall health of my business uh, i i look at it you know very frequently and i report it to the board so it's you know the summation of uh you know how much churn do i have plus how much uh expansion do i have within a certain period also yeah. i look at gross dollar retention um it feeds into nrr but if you have you know let's just say i ended last year about 116% nrr um mm-hmm. my churn my gross dollar retention uh was amazing as well if i have let me just say something hypothetical here to paint a picture if i had 80% gross 
you know, gross dollar retention and 116% NRR, you know, that means I, I managed to, you know, make up for the churn that I had plus grow the business by 16%. Now mm-hmm. that strong lever there, the gross dollar retention, if I changed that to, you know, 90% and still grew you know, or had an expansion revenue of 36%, think about what you could do and think about the power of that, right? So it's important not to just measure NRR, you got to look at your gross dollar retention all the time um, Mm -hmm. and see if you're losing, if you have a leaky bucket. Um, I'm also looking heavily at logo retention. Uh, You know, it's uh, important that you are not just monitoring the dollars, but you're looking at our logos leaving um, because you may have, logos that stay, but maybe they downsell, or maybe you have a very strong customer base in one area, um, but another segment is churning out. Like it's, it's important to look at the logo retention and dissect what's going on there. Uh, just a, a few other, or a couple other metrics. I love sentiment metrics as well. I know that this is incredibly controversial right now in the customer success world. Like does NPS matter? Um, Yes, I think it does. But I don't think it's the number that matters. I think it's the trend. So it's the trend and it's what you do with the the data that you get. Um, Of course, I want my number to always be going up and to the right, right? Like that's that's the the healthy way to go, right? So um, I'm always watching that. I'm watching the trend. I'm very proud to say ours is 70 right now. Um, and we've increased it from 30s to 70 over the last couple of years. A lot of work. Um, and it, it, while it is not the end all be all, it is, a, in my opinion, an important metric to measure. Uh, the last one I'll just call out is time to first value. Uh, and I'm not calling it out last because it's the least important. It's probably one of the most important ones because it feeds everything else. Uh, your customers per generally purchase your product to solve a problem and or to fix a gap or plug a hole or whatever, however you want to approach it. And the quicker you can get them to realize value and they know they've realized value, the better it is for your retention, for growth potential, for your NPS, for all of it. it it's kind of like the beginning of that relationship. And it's a crucial, crucial indicator and in, in in something very important to focus on. If you have a more complex product like we do, that takes a while to integrate all the data feeds and get everything up and running and get folks training or trained, uh, it's important to track that heavily, just to make sure you are, you know, always improving, always thinking through your efficiencies, and always thinking through the customer experience along the way. Um, You don't want to have somebody purchase your product, and then it takes them a year to realize your first value and the contract's up for renewal, right? That makes a very difficult conversation. Yep, yep. Lots of great insights there. I think I, I, I always find it fascinating people's use of language when they talk about these things. And you you, you you said something there about when they, you know, they, when the customer, they, they know when they, they've realized that value. I think that's one of the most challenging things that um, individual customer success managers can struggle with, right? Is like, how will they know? Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's very nuanced because you, you have to almost get into that conversation with the client about how are you going to know when you've realized like value, right? Um, what, what's that going to look like? Is that going to be a, an emotional thing? Is it going to be, you're going to be looking at a dashboard and you're going to make a decision that's different. It's, it's really, it's really difficult. And, and I was, I I mentioned someone that we had on the show last time and they were saying, you know, they were like, it can be different every time as well. Right. You're talking to every different customer and they can talk about it different ways. So I think that's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating topic, um, that, that is very close to our heart, certainly in, in my heart, in the world that we operate in. Um, you, you talked about just, just one follow up on, on that. Then you talked about the, the improvement in NPS over the last years, pretty significantly. What are some of the things that fed into that? If you don't, if you don't mind sharing on that, were there, were there some big thing, big learnings there that you, you might share? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there was any major aha moments. I think it was the evolution of what my team and myself were doing. Um, so, I would love to take credit for it, but um, the reality is, is I have an amazing team 
And what we started doing, um, when I started, there was just a couple of us. Um, We now have 15 people in the customer success org. And we started peeling off things and specializing. Um, In the beginning, the customer success manager did everything. Um, They did support. They did onboarding implementations. They did renewals. They did... Uh, the relationship management and, you know, held executive business reviews and troubles did troubleshooting on data feed issues. Right. And while that was okay, and that's, you know, early startup, we we were a 20 something person company when I joined um, that wasn't going to scale. And that wasn't going to, you know, allow us to be as efficient as we needed to be, or as deliberate about the customer experience. Um, So, you know, I, um, I look at, I tend to look at things in a very simplistic way where I always have like a goalpost and the goalpost is somewhere, you know, some time frame out, let's just call it a year. And then I tend to break things down in my brain by quarter. Like this is my goalpost of this is the customer experience I want us to have and, or I want the customer to have. Um, and, you know, one, I've confirmed that that is the right customer experience that they should have. <laughs> so I want to make sure it's not one-sided. And then I tend to break things down. Like, what do we need to do to be able to get there? And for me, immediately, it was freeing up customer success managers to where they could be customer success managers, to where they weren't doing support, to where they weren't project managing all these implementations, um, to where they were able to have a regular cadence of conversations with the customers around their goals and how they're going to achieve their goals and what does the future look like and you know thinking through uh, how mature the customer is with our product and how we help them adopt and adapt Ha moment it was more of you know helping customer success move on a journey of maturity um, and we're still we're still moving in that direction um, and you know, it, it'll probably never be done, but that definitely had a major impact into it. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so th- there's a few things there that I'll try and bring together in, in a summary later on, but I think the, um, you know, this, this recognition around in that scaling journey, the need to specialize, the need to get time back for, for CSMs to be doing the right things in a structured way with customers is, is, is kind of the foundations, I think for any any organization of any size, we're going to come back to what we think the modern CSM should be doing. So that'll link nicely there. Um, and, and then just if you think about the future, you talked about future planning and the work that your team does with customers. Let's talk a little bit about the future of, of customer success. How do you see that continuing to evolve over the next years? It's funny you ask that because I, I listen to myself making these predictions on previous podcasts and I'm usually like, way off. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Brilliant. but who, who could have predicted we would have had a pandemic? Um, so, well, th- there were people that kind of predicted it <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think that I'm, I think that over the next few years, and I'm actually seeing this kind of happen now, um, customer success is going to have more revenue accountability. Um, you know, we have gone in, in, we've gone from, um, you know, being very hard lined around customer success, not owning a number, not owning revenue, not owning, um, you know, any accountability to, to that revenue number, to um, the understanding that revenue is driven indirectly out of customer success. And now I think we're going to see it's going to be driven directly out of customer success. I saw a really great customer success maturity model being passed around and I, I wish I would have saved it, but it showed the different maturity levels of a customer success organization to where it goes from being just, you know, very immature is just like a support organization that just slaps customer success title on it to very mature where they actually handle renewals and upsells and everything like that right within the organization. I know that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, deferring thoughts on this because of course, you know, you can even hear me just a couple of years ago saying, you know, customer success is not sales. And I, I still believe that. Um, and customer success should be, you know, guarded from having those commercial conversations because we want it to be a safe haven for the customer. And in some thought, I believe that as well. However, where I have evolved in my thought process, and I think 
will continue to see this in the in the industry as well is if we are doing customer success right we are strong partners to our business partners at our customers um, and that partnership alone should make the conversations around you know the commercial things a little bit easier and it's right. kind of right now, it just feels weird sometimes that you have this strong relationship with this business partner and then it's like time for renewal. Okay, let's get a salesperson involved or time yeah. for upsell. Let's get a salesperson involved. I, I do think there are some skill sets though that customer success doesn't currently have. Um, so yeah. I see value in that, but I think that um, there needs to be something, some type of evolution to where the partnership's a little bit more seamless. Um, I currently own renewals under the customer success bucket for this yeah. very reason. Um, but I have a renewals manager who just sits in with the CSM, but it's under the customer success umbrella. It makes it feel a little bit more seamless. Yeah. Yeah. This, I think it's very interesting because no, no one wants to be handed over, right? No one wants to be handed out like, the, the history of handovers is just poor, right? You get handed over from sales to someone in services delivery, you get handed over then to CS and then to renewals. I was um, talking with a friend of mine who's a, a pretty senior in, a, in an enterprise um, uh, software company and the sheer number of people that is working with the customer, right? CS, renewals, consultancy, et cetera, et cetera. And in this particular organization, you know, they were very candid about the fact that actually the reason why we've got so many staff is we're not doing it properly, right? We're, we're, we're sort of, we, we're investing in all of these different people and functions because the actual customer success piece, we aren't getting right. So therefore, we've got to parachute someone in to handle renewals because inevitably it's factitious. Um, yeah. I'm in your school of thought. I, th I think if, if you have someone that does a great job in, in enabling the customer to realize their outcomes and does that over time and has built a good relationship, there's no better person placed, no better place, better placed person, let me get my words out, than that person to handle the commercial element. Yeah. The, the, the nuance and the challenge comes in, I think, just when you, you, you've got to have a level of commercial acumen that you've got to be able to build across a wide spectrum of people that is challenging to do and some gravitate towards that more than others right some veer away from it that for me is one of the very tricky elements is like how you balance that um so yeah no i think it's i think it's a very interesting space you were nodding your head there around the commercial i was i know that people on the podcast can't see it but i'm like a bit of a bobblehead over here just green like yes, yeah I <laughs> yeah yeah well we'll we'll talk about the the different attributes uh, again in the in in a moment um if we if we think about like uh, i i know in your career you've done a lot of work in and around customer experience and the customer journey um and given that you've you've done that both from you know building that for, for businesses and also advising on that um we we believe very deeply that customer success starts with customer onboarding given what we provide as a business right we provide an application that helps companies to onboard their customers faster uh, via an app that, that plugs into salesforce um, so we would think that. However, in your experience, why is this first step in the customer journey so critical to success? Yeah, yeah. So interestingly enough, I think more folks are coming to the realization that onboarding is incredibly critical. Uh, Donna Weber just did a book, I, and I haven't read it yet, but I purchased it, it is Onboarding Matters, yep. I think is what it's called. Um, I have it. I just haven't had the chance to read it yet. Um, and I know it's been getting a ton of attention because it's true. Onboarding does matter. And if you think about any first impression or relationship, imagine you're, you know, I've used this analogy before, but imagine you're going on a first date, right? And you meet this person and they're very charming and you're like, wow, okay, they're easy to talk to. They're just everything's easy, um, you're probably inclined to renew and go on another date, right? Um, you're probably inclined to continue exploring that relationship. But if you meet the person and you don't see that and you don't feel that, you probably won't. Um, and I know it's a little bit more complex than that, but it's also just as simple as that. Um, that first, you know, that first 
touch point, that first relationship point post-sale, um, even during sale, like onboarding actually starts before it even gets to customer success. Onboarding kind of starts in marketing. What are we selling? Are we selling the right thing? Um, are we marketing to the right fit customers? Is sales, you know, over promising, over committing, or are they, you know, are they being very real about capabilities, what we can do, what we can't do? Um, is the information being passed over to customer success uh, from sales, everything that they've learned that, you know, are key success factors, right? Um, but that, that experience for the customer in the first, you know, whatever your onboarding period is, is so crucial because that's their initial impression of you. That is, it kicks the relationship off. And if it starts off poorly, or if it starts off, you know, in chaos or unorganized or, you know, just not in an orchestrated manner, you've set yourself up for an uphill battle for renewal, period. Um, because that's yep. the impression that they have of you. Yeah. Yeah. Donna is, um, is fantastic. She, um, she's, she was she was we did the recording of her show actually last week so oh, where i okay. use the word orchestration that's that's where it comes from um and and you hit on a number of points there it's a very emotive element right you you use the example of a you know of, a, of you know the beginnings of a relationship or a or a you know you know dating i think i think that's very true it's very very emotive when people buy things both in their personal lives and in business you're never more excited i think than at the point of purchase right and um and you know it, it's the same poor onboarding in b2b is the equivalent of when you spill something on the t-shirt or the dress that you found that you love and then the first time that you wear it you, you get a stain on it right yeah, it's that yeah. level of like it's that level of, of frustration disappointment so, so you know, right yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um because you've gone through so much to get there so no i i i hear you on that and um Using one of one of one of um, uh, Donna's uh, uh, key key phrases, then if we look at the the key things that you need to get right in in order to orchestrate things well in that in that phase in that first step, what are some of the things that you found that are, are really important to focus on? Yeah, I touched upon one of them a little bit, and it's definitely that that smooth handoff between sales and CS. Um, so make sure you know it, it swiftly. We we have a. a pretty lengthy doc <laughs> that sales has to fill yep. out because it's a very technical product and we're, you know, pretty high dollar value right. customers. Um, so it's yep. having that, that smooth handoff. We do most of the time, like warm introductions to this is your implementation team. We do the kickoff call, the welcome call, um, the welcome call, like an exec will show up and we'll welcome them into the Swiftly family. Um, and, you know, it's all very orchestrated. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I, and I, again, I haven't read Donna's book yet. Now I'm, now I'm really under the gun. I need to just get it done and read it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, definitely. But yep. uh, the strong mutual plan with the customer and clear ownership points, I think is really key for successful onboarding. It's yes, it's definitely about the emotions, you know, making sure that you're driving value as quickly as possible. But especially on the more technical products, you have to have a plan. You have to let them know this is what your onboarding is going to look like. This is what we own. This is what you own. This is the cadence we're going to check in. If we fall off the rails, here's how we're going to hold each other accountable. Um, if there are any yep, roadblocks, yep. this is how we're going to react and this is how we're going to respond. Um, being very proactive about, you know, planning and having it mutually agreed upon, like, okay, dear customer, I will do my part, you need to do your part, right? So it's, yeah, it's a yeah. mutual success plan. Uh, and I think yeah. that alone can help keep that relationship feeling orchestrated and moving in the right direction. Yeah, no, you, you, you highlight something there that I, I would imagine is very important in your world, given what you guys provide, right? As you, you talked about it, it's, it's you know, it's it, you've got multiple sources of data going into the platform, right? Um, and and that's inherently complex, and so therefore the customer understanding the key dependencies that are going to be critical to success, I would imagine, is is hugely important in your world. It's very important, um, but even when 
you know, let's just say a different product line. Um, we had, uh, you know, I'll go back to the hello sign days. We had the hello sign API business where, you know, you could do an embedded workflow. Um, having a very clear documentation um, so the engineers understood exactly how to embed um, our API within their product for their e-signature solutions. And then having step-by-steps, yep. um, this is how we're going to do your approval. And this is how, and this is, you know, when you're free, like, you know, on your own, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was yep. really crucial there too. So it, it goes back to just doing what you say, saying what you do, document it and make sure everybody agrees. Yeah, absolutely. We, we use a phrase which is not, not all dependencies are created equal. And what we yes. mean by that is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of people and teams and companies, they, they focus, it, it, the, the, the immediate sort of area of focus is what they can do better and the steps that they can, how they can move faster and get more efficient and all of these types of things, which is not, not incorrect. But what companies sometimes underappreciate is that when they actually start to unpack the reasons that they see delays, a lot of it is driven by the customer, not knowing what they needed to do and when, managing yes. stakeholders, bringing state, um, subject matter experts, you know, such and such was on PTO the week that they were supposed to be doing testing. It's this type of customer planning that actually needs to be a little bit more advanced and, and thought through. It's very challenging when you're a startup because a lot of the time, right, you're employing people that might be quite young, let's say, and like you say, the CSM who's doing everything. They're not a trained project manager who's managed complex technology deployments, potentially. So it's a world that's fraught with, with complexity and challenges. And when it does go wrong, what can be done about it? How does one fess up? How do you, how do you deal with these, uh, these, complex, uh, these um, conflicts or roadblocks that might occur? Well, one, don't, don't ever be deceitful to your customer if something goes off the rails. Um, you know, I find just being honest and doing a retro or postmortem, whatever you want to call it, with the customer and say, okay, let's learn from this and let's get better from this and move forward is usually the best path to go. Just pure, straight up honesty. Um, and it actually can help actually build a much stronger relationship in the long run um, if you're just incredibly candid with each other. And you can agree upon that in the beginning. I kind of, I think I called it out a little bit as part of the, you know, strong mutual plan with clear ownership. And you just say, and if, you know, anything doesn't work in the way we attended, intended it to, you know, we're going to talk about that too. We will immediately, you know, come to you or we want you to come to us if things aren't working the way that they should be so we can write it right away. Um, I think yeah. I've seen I've seen this, you know, too many times to count to where people will hide stuff from customers, like little system outages or, you know, you name it. They will hide it because they yep. worry that it's going to kill the perception. I, I'm a believer that we can all be great when things are running well. It really takes strong teams to rise and be great when things are running poorly. Um, and as a, somebody who is also a customer of many tech tools, if things aren't working well, showing me you're going to partner with me and we're going to push through it makes me respect you a lot more. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Interesting. It's interesting you mentioned that. So one of the commercial team was telling me they um, they had this new new potential customer. They wanted a couple of references, and they are, they um, we provided them. One of the companies, one of the questions that was asked was, was there any downtime? And with this particular company, they're a client, they're a satellite company, and they were like, no, 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 no downtime over the last five years. The other company said, yeah, there was. There was an issue. We had a, an issue with an, a, a, an upgrade. Um, something wasn't tested. A um, bit, bit, of, bit of ownership on that on both sides, right? Um, but the customer said, you know, how they dealt with it, right, makes me want to stay with them even more because I've not had someone deal with a problem like that, which I've seen with other suppliers, and they were the first ones to say, this is an issue, we're going to deal with it, here's how we're going to fix it. Yes, it's going to take three days to fix it, but it's going to be fixed. And that was quite illuminating to me, I thought, because the, the, the new client actually told us that. So, yeah, so yeah I think uh, it's, it's, I, honestly, it's gold. It's absolutely more. gold because we're in tech. 
let's be real in SAS yeah. and tech, yeah. we do releases frequently. We move fast yeah. and sometimes right. we break stuff, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. It's going to happen. And it's yeah. not yeah. about, of course, we don't want to break stuff, but it's going to happen. And it's more about when things aren't going well and when you break something or something deviates from plan, like how do you respond, right? You don't hide it. Yeah. You just come forward and you say, look, this is what's going on and this is how we're going to fix it. And hopefully yeah. the customers want to link arms with you. Well, this dovetails quite nicely into the last piece to talk about. I mean, um, we're try- I'm trying to sort of change up some of the topics because I like to hear different perspectives on, on different things. I want to talk about like, the individuals that are involved here because, for example, you know, the communications element, the, the talking to the customers, that, that rests with the, oftentimes the customer success manager. And we've talked about some very positive elements of that role and some things that they have to deal with, which are very, um, you know, very challenging. So what, in your view, are some of the key attributes of the modern CSM today? Yeah, um, I mean, there's there's all of the standard stuff that I'm sure you hear everyone talk about, like, you know, great project manager, strong communicator. Um, you know, I also love to see folks that are okay with looking at data and being able to pick and pluck trends from data. With the new environment we're in with folks being remote, um, I also, and this is kind of going to be an interesting one, but I like to see people have who have a little bit of like an entrepreneurial side, that they look at their book of business like it's their business. Like they yep. own that business. This isn't just a job. This is you know, this is fun for them. They're looking at this like, okay, where is where are all my customers? What do they need? How can we grow them? How can I make sure they're getting tremendous value out of what they've purchased? How can I get creative with them if they're having roadblocks on their side? Um, of course, I'm definitely talking about, you know, B2B enterprise kind of motion, right? That wouldn't scale with the digital, you know, touch or tech touch, whatever we're calling it right now. Um, But on B2B Enterprise, I like somebody who looks at their portfolio, like it's like their business. Um, And I think that's going to be key uh, for customer success managers going forward, uh, especially as I I said earlier, I think there's going to be a bigger focus on revenue ownership and, and all of that in the coming year or so. And that's that having that entrepreneur way is going to, I think, pave the path for that. Okay. I mean, in, in your world, your, your, your proposition is you're working with a huge amounts of transportation data. I think I read that your work impacts more than one and a half billion people and how they, they travel, right? Yeah. Which is incredible. Um, now, in, in that world, I could imagine that the domain expertise of some description plays a very important part. Tell us a little bit about how important that is for you guys and, and in general. Yeah, so at Swiftly, we hire folks that come from both you know, tech and public transportation. So I think domain okay. expertise can be very important. Um, and I see value in folks having domain expertise, but I don't think it's the end all be all. Um, I think every team should have a mix. If you ha- are working in a specialized field like I am, having a good balance of folks that you know come from the domain uh, and can bring in the, the lingo and the speak and how to navigate is important, but also having folks that can balance it out and have come from maybe customer success or tech or whatever it may be um, is helpful too. So um, I I don't, you know, I, I'm never one that's going to say hire everybody only with domain expertise or hire everybody only with um, tech expertise. I think it's important that you look at the makeup of your team and the needs of your customer and you balance it from there. Wonderful. Great. Well, I'm conscious of the time for two reasons. One, you've got another meeting and I don't want you to be stressed on your anniversary day. So thank you ever so much for taking the time to join today. It's been hugely appreciated. I think there's a, there's a number of things for people tuning in that I think I, I take away from today. I think one, if we think about those trends, I think that revenue accountability is going to be one of the key things that is going to, going to um, crystallize over the next years. Metrics that matter, you know, NRR, gross dollar retention, time to first value, and of course, sentiment. Um, you know, the route to ARR is not just 
uh, sales. It's, it, it is how passionately your customers feel about you and your product. Um, I, I think um, the, the other piece that I like was for anyone that's scaling, because I, I, I sort of think about this as well, which is like, don't overload yourselves with all the things you could be doing. Focus on what are the goalposts for that particular quarter, because inevitably, if you bite off more than you can chew, you're gonna you're gonna trip yourself up. And I think that's true for for in, in terms of my own experience. So thank you. I think there were some some great things in there. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, for more insights and resources, you can visit our website precursor.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our series on whichever platform you're listening in on. Um, which can be Google, Spotify, or Apple, of course. Tell your friends and family. Have a wonderful weekend. And again, Miranda, thank you so much for joining. Did you enjoy it? I did. This was a great time. Thank you for having me. And what a wonderful way to wake up. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, I'm going to have a beer now. So, <laughs> so a little early. The end of it's my a little day. early for me for a beer. <laughs> yeah, a little early for you. Yeah, there we go. Well, have a great day. Lovely, lovely to have you on. And thank you ever so much. Thank you.